So now it's time for the word. Let's, uh, before we get into chapter 2, Steps to Christ, let's, let's have an opening prayer together. Bow to God. Our Father in heaven, we come to you now in, in great need. We come to you in the need of the Holy Spirit to be upon us, to lead us, to open our mind to this difficult topic, yet relieving Help us to see the beauty in all of it, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. When I do this lecture, this is the lecture that I, you know, I told you all last week I did at uh, 3ABM, but I do a similar lecture when we go off in different times in a revival seminar. The topic, the idea of this topic is the one I get in the most trouble for. It's the one that causes the, the most like, consternation. And, but, I, but today we're specifically going to drive into chapter 2, Steps to Christ. And, and I hope that you'll see in it there's a beautiful undertow running. The last time we left off, uh, last week, we left off with this amazing statement that says this. Such love is without a parallel. Children of the heavenly king, precious promise, theme for the most profound meditation the matchless love of God for a world that did not love him. The thought has a subduing power upon the soul and brings the mind into captivity to the will of God. So your homework was to take chapter 1, Steps to Christ, and apply the principles. To see what just solely contemplating the love of God does to the soul. Does it begin to, to bring the mind into captivity to the will of God? Does the heart begin to soften in in high school, our high school football coach used to tell us this when we would complain about losing a game, which we did often. <laughs> when we went, I went to school at Tarkington. It was a little, little, small school. But he would say this. He would take the play and he would put it on the board and he would say, Gentlemen, every play is designed for a touchdown. Every single play, if executed perfectly, all 11 men do their job, it's a score. So the problem is... Someone on the field did not execute the play. And this statement, and I want to keep coming to this, if executed properly. If we really are understanding the playbook of the book Steps to Christ, not just a little book that we hand out to people to get to know them of Jesus and the little pictures of Jesus handing out literature on the cities. Or, this is the playbook. If we grasp it's chapters, all 13, and execute the ideas behind it, you will become completely a different person. The mind will become subdued. The will will be brought into captivity to God, and amazing things will happen in this church and wherever these principles are applied. In the book Desire of Ages, Wednesday night, I urge you to come. As we flesh these things out in a little bit more intimate group, but we really are talking about some of the things that God has promised to his, his church, to his people. And we're in chapter 73 next week, we, or this week you come into chapter 74. But in 73 chapters, we have come across things that God is willing to do. He wants to fill us as a people. We've talked about that he wants to shine out from us. We've seen that, that God has no restrictions, no cap, no limit on what he can do in a person that applies the principles of the gospel. And so I thought it would be wise for us now in, in this new year coming up to spend some time making sure we get this, this thing down. And so we're going to look at why do we not then? So the question really comes up in chapter 1 at the end when we talk about the mind is brought into captivity to the will of God. The question is why then doesn't it? If the love of God concentrated on rightly can bring you into a subjugation to God's will, then the question is back on us, why does it not do that? The promise is from God. It cannot be his fault, right? Why then? And that is the point of chapter 2. Chapter 2, actually the original book, the original writing of Steps to Christ in 1892 didn't start with a chapter 1. It had, for chapter 1, it had the sinner's need. And if we can understand this, then we can understand why it is maybe that the love of God has not done its work in our lives as it should. And so we are going to get into that. Now let's go through one of these paragraphs in chapter 2. 
and start to understand why is it that we struggle with grasping this thing called the gospel. Man was originally endowed with noble powers and a well-balanced mind. He was perfect in his being and in harmony with God. His thoughts were pure, his aims holy. But through disobedience, his powers were perverted and selfishness took the place of love. His nature became so weakened through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of evil. He was made captive by Satan and would have remained so forever had God not specially interposed. That is how terrible sin can grip a hold of you. And it actually even gets worse. In chapter 2 of Steps to Christ, as, as we have are going along in it now, she actually talks about the principles of the kingdom of heaven. That heaven is a place that sinners without realizing it would not want to be. That sin is so degraded the human race, if we really and truly understood the principles of the kingdom of heaven, most people would find it a place that, that was unwelcome to their fallen nature. I mean, Hollywood paints the picture of heaven with harps and eternal life and not getting sick and seeing all our dead ones. And so, of course, everyone would want to be there. But if we really look at the principles of the kingdom of heaven, many people would think, ah, eternity? I had this conversation with a friend one time. This is when I was um, working in the construction field with my brother. And him and I were, were speaking about the, these ideas of the kingdom of heaven. We were talking about all the things that heaven will be like and all the things that heaven will not have. <laughs> and we was going on, yeah, there's not going to be any fishing and hunting in heaven. <laughs> there ain't going to be any football games in heaven. There's going to be no kickoff, no playoffs, no Super Bowl. There's not going to be no barbecue. And we was going off and on and talking, man, everyone's going to love one another. Everyone's going to be kind. Everyone we was going just back and forth into the back. We didn't realize it, but one of... One of our co-workers, his name was Lyle, he was listening to our conversation and his face was all wrinkled up like this. God knew nothing of the gospel, nothing of, of truth. And he piped into our conversation. He says, you mean to tell me in heaven there ain't going to be any bars, no drinking, no alcohol? We was like, no. He said, no sports, no TV. We said, Probably not. And his face distorted. He says, no women? Now, you know what he meant by no women. <laughs> and we like, oh, I don't think so. And then he said this, the most truthful statement I think I've ever heard. Then who in the H-E double hockey sticks would want to be there? And I thought about this statement in Steps to Christ. As she says that we're living in a world filled with people because of their fallen nature. If they truly understood what heaven was offering them, they would not really want to be a part of that for eternity. Yeah, they don't want to die. Yeah, we don't want to be sick. Yeah, we want to go out and hang out and then do what we want to do. You hear it at every funeral. Yep, oh, he's up there fishing right now with Jesus. He's up there probably deer hunting. He's in like, no. He's not doing none of those things. You go to graveyards and you'll see they'll have, they'll have things that they loved in this life on their graveyard, four-wheelers and cars or guns. Or, you know, it's all kind of this stuff. It's, it's an idea that's wrong. And we really need to understand this. And it's the point that chapter 2 is trying to help us to understand before it's too late that the sinner has a need that he's not fully aware of. He doesn't really understand that the principles of the kingdom of heaven, he really and she really don't like. And so the chapter is trying to bring us to the point in the gospel where we need to have one of these honest moments with God so that we can be healed of that. And we call this, to use a theological term, let's use something now that we've said much, but now we can understand these ideas that I'm talking about the kingdom of heaven is like, we could call that righteousness. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness. It is perfection, perfectly right doing. The law is an expression of perfect righteousness. When Jesus came from heaven, he came to live out righteousness, the principles of the kingdom of heaven, not just what we think of the Ten Commandments, but he came to show us what heaven was like. And he came to live it out perfectly, to demonstrate the atmosphere of God's place that we call heaven. And we call that righteousness. The Sermon on the Mount, which was really a deeper expression of the Ten Commandments, but really it was what righteousness is. 
Love the neighbor, right? Turn the other cheek if someone slaps you. If someone curses you, you bless them. If someone steals something from you, you give them something else to take along the way. All of those principles are what we call principles of righteousness. And Jesus came to show you that this is what eternity is going to be like every day forever and ever. And the, the man and the woman might be tempted to go, Ugh, that's it. Oh, yeah, nothing but pure love and serving everyone else. But I live a life where I, where I serve only myself for most of the time. I only worry about myself most of the time or those that are closest to me. Well, heaven is everyone serving everyone else and never serving themselves, but everyone is serving them. These are the principles of righteousness. And chapter 2 of Steps to Christ wants us to understand that maybe we really don't want to go to heaven as much as we think that we do. And so before we will ever desire his righteous life, chapter 2 is this. Before we will ever desire his righteous life imputed to me by faith, before I will ever desire his righteous life imparted to me in that working out process, before I will ever see heaven in any light that it actually is, I have to first come to understand that I have a need, that I have a broken foul nature that is not in compliance with righteousness, that actually doesn't want righteousness, that doesn't like righteousness, that naturally gravitates toward self-righteousness and selfishness, that my righteousness is a filthy, you know what, a filthy rag, chapter 2, the sinner's need. It's insufficient to please God. I have a need, and my life is a shipwreck because I don't know real righteousness. Not only do I not have real righteousness, actually most of my life I have never really understood what real righteousness was. To me, it was just a theological term that preachers used that meant something about keeping the law the perfect way. But no, real righteousness is something that my mind never even looked at, and that is why my life was such a mess. Now, the second great point that is made clear in chapter 2 is this. So, number one, you got a need. You just are not aware of that need. Not in the way that God wants us to be aware of it. But here's the second great point. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil and we cannot change them. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Education, culture, the exercise of the will, human effort all have their proper sphere, but here they are powerless. They may produce an outward correctness of behavior, but they cannot change the heart. They cannot purify the springs of life. There must be a power working from within a new life from above before men can be changed from sin to holiness that power is christ his grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to god in holiness catch that little phrase we are not really attracted to god it is only a power from outside ourselves working within that can begin to attract me to real righteousness, that I can desire it to be clothed and covered in it and to become like it because by nature I am not attracted to that. And it is this process of chapter 2 that we must, you must hurdle across this chapter if we're ever to be set free from this love affair of the world that we have, from this strange infatuation, as she says in Desire of Ages, a strange infatuation was such a, a cruel and evil place. So to answer your question from the beginning, why is it that my soul is not attracted to God? Why is it that I am not being subdued by the will of God and my mind being brought into captivity to his will? Chapter 2 answers that. It, chapter 1 ends with that question. Chapter 2 says it's because you have a fallen, broken nature Pastor Davis need. That's what's wrong with you. That's why there's the attraction. That's why this thing isn't working that God says, just focus on my love. And if you'll do that, I will completely bring your entire life into harmony to my will. But then why isn't that happening? Because you're not looking at my love, Damon. Why are you not looking? Because you're not attracted to it. And 
And what we do, and what we do often is when we get right here, and this is where chapter two starts making people real uncomfortable. What we want to do, and what I beg you not to do, is to default to your theoretical understanding of the gospel, your belief in Bible prophecy, the 2200 years, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Don't default to what you believe to be biblically true as your assurance. Your knowledge of prophecy, your belief in that the, the papacy is at some point going to inflict the mark of the beast or you understand what the seal of God is or I understand the centrality of the seventh day, the Sabbath to God's law, to the plan of salvation. Don't, don't ever make that mistake. This is what I did all through my 20s and 30s. I thought I was good with God because I understood the truth of prophecy and I would never do X, Y, or Z because I believe the truth. But unless you are saved by the gospel, by Christ, unless you have him dwelling in the heart and in the soul changing you, you are absolutely lost. Now, prophecy and theology and doctrine have their proper place. As she said, they have their proper place. But today we're not talking about that stuff. We are talking about allowing God to do something in you that he wants to do, that he needs to do. And you've got to take this painful step we're going to see because it's interesting that in the book desire of ages we have been studying this kind of almost parallel with today's topic in chapter 73 it was it took us four weeks to get through that usually it's one a week one chapter a week we stopped and we slowed way down and we was like oh man we have just stumbled across a gold mine of information and so we was we're into the life of peter and peter is being brought through this chapter two steps to christ Look, Paul gives the greatest evidence of this truth when he says this in Romans chapter 7. This is verse 16, verse 12, and verse 14. He said, I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is holy, the commandment holy and just and good. But he added, in the bitterness of his soul, anguish, and despair, I am carnal, sold under sin. He longed for the purity, the righteousness to which he himself was powerless to attain. And he cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And I'm telling you right here, this is the absolute first work of the gospel. This is the place where we start experiencing the gospel. We can talk all about Calvary's cross, and we will later in when we get to chapter 3, and his righteousness imputed to me by faith. We'll get to those things, but right here is the step of the gospel that many people will not take. We have got to be brought to the place to where we say, O oh, wretched woman, O oh, wretched man, O oh, wretched young person that I am, who is going to save me? Until that is a cry from my heart, we have not yet known the gospel. And it is something that is inspired and can only happen under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not dare yet come to you in that way until you take chapter two's step. It's such a beautiful thing, but I get it. It's difficult. In fact, Revelation 3 verse 17, you know, I even hate reading the text of the Laodicean message. For they are miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. But you know what it says about them, the last sentence? It's such an interesting phrase. It says this, they have no need. Chapter 2 is called, coming to understand the sinner's need. Before Laodicea can ever become righteous by faith, they got to cross this bridge in chapter 2. The problem is... I think that we're so used to seeing ourselves the way we see ourselves, and we're not bad people. I mean, from a certain point of view, we're all pretty good people. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. Good middle class, most of us. Some of us upper class. Some of us a little bit lower class, but hardworking. We're all good, ethical, moral people coming to church on the seventh day when everyone else is going out there on the wrong day. We try to eat what's right. We try to do what's right. And we start measuring ourselves in these kind of circles. Now, I've told this story here before when I first came to this church. This is like a new church now, almost four years later. I love telling the story of Guyman, Oklahoma. And when we moved to Guyman, Oklahoma, we left the Texas conference. We went up to Guyman, and we drove all the way across the country. We pulled up, and there we were starving to death. And we pulled into a Taco Bell, and we stepped out of the car, and this smell hit us. This terrible, tremendous stench. 
And we asked the lady at the counter, we said, what is that smell? And she said, Mary, what smell? I was like, what? What are you talking about? And later we found out, you know, it's a, it's a place where they butcher 55,000 hogs a day or a week or something like that. I think it's a week. And they have these rendering plants where they cook all the nasty parts down, you know, the fat and the jowls, and they cook it all down into an oil, and it stinks. We had been there about two or three years, and <laughs> we had gotten used to it, and we, was, we invited some friends from Texas. Uh, they came down, and they pulled into our driveway. We ran out, oh, Mary, and then she went, oh, what's that horrible smell? And Mary went, what smell? The point is clear, right? You get used to the stench. We get used to our own spiritual body odor. We get used to our sin. We get used to not being like, Jesus, that's Jesus. He was Jesus. Yeah, he was, and and he was perfect, but, but he is surely calling me up, not for him to come down. He calls me up. And we get used to our foul tempers. Look, I know, 54 years old, and I still struggle with temper sometimes. And there was a time in my life, I remember in my first marriage, I just said, you know, well, but everyone knows that uh, Italians are that way. I'm half, so at least give me half a break. We, we throw things, we scream, we yell, and then we're okay. It's all right to be that way. It's okay to make your wife cry and be mad and upset. It's okay to be mean to your husband. It's okay to yell, be a tyrant, be upset. It's okay to gossip and manipulate. Well, because we're really just telling the truth. It's, and we get so used to the way that we are, and that we're okay because we're going to church, we're keeping the Sabbath, we're doing this and that, and we believe in this and this, and we get used to it. And chapter 2 is like, if you really as a people want to become the remnant, you're going to have to embrace chapter 2 and realize that I'm not used to it. God's like, I'm not used to it, never have been, and never will be. And I need you not to be used to it because then I can do something about it. You've heard me say it a thousand times, let life's situations expose you and tell the truth. When you get mad, then say, okay, God, I shouldn't have been mad. Why was I mad? The third great point, and it's another driving point, once God gets us to this place, so here's the beauty of chapter 2, once God uses life, and I'm telling you, he can use life to cause, to crush out of you that cry that says, ah, God, get it. Once he gets you there, and he will if you let him, but it's not pleasant Listen to this. The third point of this chapter is let him get you there because such is the cry that has gone up from burdened hearts in all lands. And in all ages to all there is but one answer. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Here is where the gospel is almost like it's beating heart right here. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to slice and slash and wound and cause you to weep between the porch and the altar. Show you stuff that you don't want to see. But when you begin to finally cry out and give up on yourself and realize you don't got it all together like you think, then where thousands, if not millions of the world have said, okay, they cry out and God says, ah, behold, behold the lamb, right? To that awareness, Jesus brings this beautiful offer. And now in our steps to cry, I mean, our desire of ages study, chapter 73, We're going to jump train tracks now from Steps to Christ to Desire of Ages for just a second because this was the the title of the chapter. You remember what the title of chapter 73 was? Let not your heart be troubled. That doesn't mean anything to me out of John 14 because I've heard it so many times. Oh, yeah, don't let your heart trouble because you're about to see me crucified. You're about to see me go to Calvary. You're going to have a great disappointment. You're going to be persecuted and chased, and don't let your heart be troubled. That's not the point of the title. Don't let your heart be troubled was chosen for the title of chapter 73 because of the experience of Peter and the disciples. And the entire chapter is leading us to this place where Peter and the disciples, especially Peter and Judas, will not admit the sinfulness of their nature. Jesus has told them twice 
you are all going to leave me and betray me. And Peter stands up and says, I could never do that. I would die first. And Jesus says, Peter, a second time, you're going to be the chief traitor. You're going to leave me and go, and you're going to three times deny me. And Peter's like, I can't do that. The whole point of chapter 73 is that Peter had sin that he was completely unaware of. He had capacity within him to do terrible things that he did not know. And chapter 73 is the story of Peter when he comes to this place. I told you it's a difficult chapter to listen to. It's the story of Peter coming to this place and admitting it. Because what was going to trouble their heart was not the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. It was their own selves. Your heart is going to be so troubled when you figure out what you really are, Peter. Judas, your heart is going to be so troubled when I show you that you're a liar and a thief. In fact, Judas's trouble with heart was so bad he took his own life. But the disciples, the other 11, they had remembered what Jesus said. And this is, the, this is where the, the title starts, the chapter starts to turn. They had remembered something that he said because their hearts were all about to be weeping and troubled and felt like traitors of the Son of God. Especially, think about this, on the morning of the resurrection. When he raises up and he shows himself, how would you feel if you abandoned Jesus and left him, denied his name three times, <laughs> cursed, and then you see him walking around in three days? That's why Jesus was very careful to come to Peter. And remember, he told the woman, go tell Peter. His heart is troubled because he has finally saw the truth of who he was. He'd been with me three and a half years. He thought he was the man. And now I was able to show him the truth and he can't bear it. But listen to this. There was a faith statement that kept the 11 from committing suicide. And they remembered something that he said to them that night. He says, Jesus looks with compassion on his disciples. He cannot save them from the trial, but he does not leave them comfortless. He assures them that he is to break the fetters of the tomb and that his love for them will not fail. After I'm risen again, he says, I will go before you into Galilee. Before the denial, they have the assurance of forgiveness. After his death and resurrection, they knew that they were forgiven and were dear to the heart of Christ. That is the great gospel story. Like he was already telling, look, I know what you're going to do, but meet me beforehand. And wait a minute, so we're going to betray you, deny your name, but go ahead and meet us and we're still, all, we're still good terms with you? He's like assuring them that when I show you what you are, don't freak out about it because I will forgive you. I will cover you and you will still be just as close to me. I will love you just as much. Don't worry when I show you things. I think the reason why for myself most of my life I didn't want to see the truth about myself is because I didn't want to face it. I didn't want to be seen that way. I didn't want to be that kind of person. But Jesus already knew the truth about who I was. And he's like, Damon... <laughs> You're going to have to get over that self-image, that image management that you got. I'm going to show you something, but don't worry. I love you. I'm going to forgive you, and I'm not going to see you that way. And that's what gave these 11 men the strength to return and meet him because they didn't have to meet him in Galilee. They could have all went their separate way, but they had the assurance of forgiveness before the sin, and so do you. When he shows up and he shows you things, you have the assurance of forgiveness. You have the promise of his love. And he says, so, so let me help you through this process that's going to be nasty and painful. Once man would recognize his fallen estate, then he could impute to them his perfect righteousness and have their sin imputed or, or accredited to himself. Then he could do all kinds of wonderful things and change us and transforms us and help us to where our wills and minds are submitted to the will of God if we take this first step. This is what Jude chapter 1 verse 24, that little book right before the book of Revelation Jude one twenty four. It says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you 
faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I mean, I, I love this way it says this. In other words, Jesus can't wait to present you before the Father faultless with joy in his heart like it's a brand new, this is like a brand new being, Lord. He's, he's never sinned. He's never. He can present you to the Father and the Father doesn't go, yeah, but I know who Damon was. I know what he did in that church. I know what he said. I know what he. No, it's not. I will present you faultless with joy before the Father. Like, look at him. Look at him, Lord. He is like me. And that's all that the Father sees. And that's what Jesus is telling Peter. I want you to know this. It's not the Father is not going to look at your mess, Peter. I'm going to present you one day in my perfection, in my righteousness, in my obedience, in my love. I am going to present you. And therefore, our shame and our guilt and our failures are swallowed up in Christ. So it's given you confidence in chapter 2 to let go and let him in and say, ah. Let him, it's like when I go, every time I go to Dr. Lopes, I hate going to Dr. Lopes because he's going to tell me the truth of what he sees in my mouth. And he's going to be looking, and I can't lie to Dr. Lopes. Have you been brushing your teeth? Yeah. Have you been flossing? Mm-hmm. No, you have not because he can see, and he's picking, and he's looking, and, well, you know, But I trust Dr. Lopes that he's not going to go off and say, hey, guess what? Your pastor ain't flossing. (laughs) When I leave there, I'm still his good friend. And this is the point of chapter 2. He's going to see some things. He's going to help you through them. But you've got to be honest with him. You've got to let these processes work. You've got to give the Holy Spirit permission to use life. So when you go off or when things don't go wrong and, and all these crazy things are happening... I guarantee you it's not just the devil harassing you, which it may be, but God is allowing it to bring up, stir up, chapter 73, to stir up sin. This is what Paul says in Romans 7, that the law stirs up sin that we might be saved by faith. And now something absolutely beautiful. When you let him in and you let the truth come out, He will take your sin and give you something. This is one of these most amazing quotes from Wednesday night. This is astounding. We all sat there and was just shocked last Wednesday night. Through apparent impossibilities, though apparent impossibilities obstruct their way, by his grace they are to go forward. Instead of deploring difficulties, they are called upon to surmount them. They are to despair of nothing and hope for everything. With the golden chain of his matchless love, Christ has bound them to the throne of God. It is his purpose that the highest influence in the universe, emanating from the source of all power, shall be theirs. They are to have power to resist evil, power that neither earth nor death nor hell can master, power that will enable them to overcome as Christ overcame. This is the process that we're going through. This is the early steps of now beginning to go to God and say, Lord, show me the nightmare. Just I'm going to open up my heart to you and show me the snake den. Show me the worms and the grime and the goo and the gunk. Let me see what no one else can see, not even myself. And God's like, thank you very much. Stand aside. we got some work to do. And when I do it, I am going to forgive you and love you. But now that power, the greatest. Think about this. The greatest power in the universe. Emanating from the greatest power that there is shall be yours. (laughs) Exciting a little bit. You just got to take this step in chapter 2. Now you can be subdued by the love of God. Now the mind can be brought into captivity to the will of God. Then we will start desiring a righteous life. Then the principles of the kingdom of heaven will be, well, desirous to me. I won't care what politician is running. Oh, I get it. We People like to vote and throw their vote on this side. Oh, you don't care about those things. They're all corrupt and crooked. I won't care about what entertainments are going on in the world. I I will start to change my lifestyle, my diet. Everything will start to move towards the heavenly way. I will be living heaven on earth. And when it comes, we just take one step and we're in a very comfortable home. For a lot of people, it would be a very uncomfortable place immediately. 
and to them they won't be there. If, if living like heaven on earth is uncomfortable, you are in trouble. If giving your money and your time and sacrificing for God and for others is uncomfortable, if love and compassion and kindness is uncomfortable and hard for you, you are in trouble. And it's time at this late stage in the ball game, to confess that and say, yeah, I think I might have some problems, Lord. So do your, as in chapter 73 it says, in Desire of Ages, remember she said that God was pruning Peter and in his hand was a skillful hand and in the hand of God that knife was pruning Peter and she says there was no unwantingness in that hand. Nothing in that hand that was there to hurt Peter. Nothing in that hand that had censure or harm to Peter. It was going to hurt Peter, but it was a hand of love. He's going there like a surgeon going, shh. That's what you have to let him do. Today, that's going to be our homework, to go home at some point in this week and say, God, okay. I heard it. I get it. It's step two to the gospel. The chapter ends this way, and so will we. Shall we not regard the mercy of God? What more could he do? Let us place ourselves in right relation to him who has loved us with amazing love. Let us avail ourselves of the means provided for us that we may be transformed into his likeness and be restored into fellowship with the ministering angels to harmony and communion with the Father and the Son. That's how chapter 2 ends. So let us put, now think about that statement in all that we've said. Let us put ourselves in right relation to him. That means, I want to explain to you what that means from Genesis, our last text. Genesis 9 is the right relation to him. Genesis chapter 9, it's how you need to look at this whole chapter. Genesis 9, it's a very strange text, but I hope it will make have some meaning after today's lecture. Verse 22, and Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. This is a right relation to God. Noah was a sinner. Noah was a symbol of our sin and our unrighteousness in this moment of his life. And we have some people in our lives that are filled under satanic influence to go and spread about your sin. To go shout to the world, oh, you took my dad is laying in there naked. Oh, it's terrible. Come look. That's a satanic mindset to go about and talking about other people's failures and sin. It's exposing their nakedness. We are to be like Christ. Christ is pictured as Shem and Japheth who went in backwards. They knew their father was naked. They went in backwards and then covered. It's a picture of Christ. He knows you're naked. He knows you're sinful. And he comes in and he just covers you gently and he wraps you up and then brings you to the Father. He does not want to see your sin. He doesn't loud it out. He doesn't hold it over our heads. He says, in fact, I will never remember it ever again. I only need you to know that you're naked and need covering. And then I'll come in like this because I don't want to see that of you. I want to present you before my father with joy. And I'm going to. <laughs> Why would we not? How could we not? Allow that cutting work of the Holy Spirit in chapter 2. The sinners need to come in and start showing me my need. I promise you this, it will heal your marriage. 100, forget about marriage counseling. Forget about self-help books. Quit trying to argue it out with one another, who's right and who's wrong. You ain't going to ever get to the bottom of it because men are women and women are women, and you ain't never going to see things on the same page, ever. It will heal your marriage. It will make you a pleasant mother, a pleasant father. Your kids will see in you a righteousness like Christ. They'll want to gravitate towards the church, do like I did, and pound doctrine in their head, and they'll flee from it. It'll make you a good friend, a good brother, a good sister. 
it will make you a church person that can withstand the issues of being in a Seventh-day Adventist church. He'll help you handle all the politics and storms of other people's mess. It'll help you handle your own mess. This gospel message begins here today with you. You choose what you're going to do with it. You can ignore it and go on back your business and be happy keeping the Sabbath. Or tonight and sometime in the coming week, you can go out to somewhere, some pasture, some closet, some room, and say, Lord, <laughs> oh, Lord, this is going to be my prayer from now on to you. I'm going to pray what David prayed in Psalm 139. In verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. That is your homework this week. And then step back because God in his good timing, it may not be tomorrow or the next day, but in his timing when the situation is perfect, he is going to allow nonsense to hit. And then he's going to say, hey, hey, shh, 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 shh. look in here. And hopefully, prayerfully, you'll start saying, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall save me? <laughs> if you read chapter 8, verse 1 in Romans, the comp completion of that, oh, I thank God through Jesus Christ there is now no condemnation in those who are in him. That's what we're after. And then we can take the next step next week, chapter 3 next week. Don't let the title fool you, repentance. But we're going to take that step next week and see what real repentance looks like. For now, we're going to have prayer and ask God to help us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. And we are grateful for the great plan of salvation, for the great gospel message that we have a heavenly Father that will walk in backwards to the room of our heart and life and cover us with his righteousness that no one may ever see it again, our sinfulness. But Father, getting us to that place of self-discovery, getting us to that place of honesty before you is difficult because our fallen nature does not want it to be exposed. God, if there be any man or woman here, any married couple, any family, any child that needs to take that step and, and is thinking of it, Lord, this week, remind them to come to you and simply ask that prayer, the one prayer that you will never, ever turn down. May you bless us, Lord, as we take this wonderful step of trust and vulnerability before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.